myself and allow Peggy to go ahead and introduce herself. And I will also start um, turning off videos and things like that. So um, yeah, go ahead, Peggy. Awesome. So I'm going to try this just briefly, turn on my video. You may or may not be able to see me. So it's so hard to listen to those of us on Zoom if you can't see us. Um, that was your brief moment. And um, because on the Coyote program, if you saw it, if you didn't, it's going to be in that uh, list of YouTubes. My video was on the whole time. We were all very new to Zoom and I'm just chatting away and people could see me the whole time and I didn't know they could. So I'm trying to control that a little bit and you'll have more fun watching the slides and just listening, I think, than watching my facial expressions and talking with my hands is a little bit common. And I know some of the people that are on today know that about me. So we're going to switch that back off and we'll get going forward. So just as a starter, there is a, a link here at the beginning that will be offered at the end. And one of the things that we are trying to do through all this, um, we do it all the time. We assess uh, while we're teaching to be sure that we're bringing you information. You know, we're supposed to be bringing you science-based information that hopefully is enjoyable and adds to your repertoire of knowledge. So at the, the beginning here, you'll see that, that evaluation, but it will be offered at the end as well as a QR code. And we ask that you uh, take just a couple minutes to answer those so we can make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And I will challenge you that with my first webinar, I had 180 people that actually did the survey, which helped me know what I was doing and what to change or alter in my program uh, to make it better for the next time I offer it. So I appreciate you considering that um, at the end and you can go back in as well and do that anytime. So this program, we'll go ahead and, and see if we can get it to move forward. So the Woodpeckers of Illinois, this started because I went down to do a totally different program and stayed at a friend's bed and breakfast down in the central part of Illinois called Peace of Earth Lodge. And uh, my friend Tim built these individual cabins on the ground level, but the porches attached that you walk onto are in the trees. You literally are built on the side of a, of a ravine. As I'm trying to write a program, there were so many woodpeckers because the habitat of these large deciduous trees was perfect for almost every single species. Uh, and it was May, so there were even, even some sap suckers, and we'll talk about those different ones. And I got to thinking about uh, what, what I wanted to know. So this is a, a, some education and some entertainment and some great photos. I do want to give some credit to a friend of mine, Ken Reinhardt. When we pull photos for our work, we have to have them uh, we, they can't be copyright protected and I it's hard to find all the woodpeckers you want to find pictures of and I want to give Ken credit for just opening up his Flickr page for me and saying go to it and there are some other ones but they are they're noted so when when you think about woodpeckers it's one of the things that um, as a child, children all recognize woodpeckers. It's like, we don't have to tell them. The funny thing is when they see other birds like a brown creeper or a nuthatch, the first thing they yell is, is woodpecker because it's such a specific bird action that those birds also do. So we're gonna go through and see and talk about what makes these woodpeckers special. Now the beaks, you know, everything, um, many birds peck at things, beaks are critical. Animals have tools, whether it's a mammal, uh, with teeth and claws. In the case of the birds, their beak is one of their most important tools because that's what feeds them. And they peck at many things. Turkeys eat tons of insects as they walk along. Uh, the picture has the, the robin with the worm and it makes you think about, it's like working with your hands tied behind your back. They don't feel that way, but that mouth has to be everything. Hand, uh, the spoon, everything to get that animal fed. And the chickadee at the bottom, I use that picture to remind myself to share with you, birds, even our woodpeckers, cannot open the seeds you feed them. They don't have what we would, what we would call a gross beak, a, a beak made like a set of pliers. The muscles in a woodpecker's jaw, and also in this chickadee's jaw, aren't strong enough to crack seed. So they literally, a chickadee has to remove a seed from your feeder if it's a shelled seed, because they love oil, uh, oil sunflower seeds, take it to another location, perch, hold it, peck it open, and go back and get another one. Now, if you're in a location where you have a, a, a seriously cold winter, like we do in Northern Illinois, a chickadee needs the equivalent of 250 fat calories, 
or, or the equivalent of, two, of 250 black oil sunflower seeds in calories per night. So they have to eat 250 sunflower seeds to get the calories they need because they shiver 20% of their body weight off at night. I would love to be able to eat like that, but I can't, right? But that's a lot of work. And they choose that. And that's, you know, that's an interesting choice. So maybe unhulled seeds might be helpful for those guys. So just something to add to your thoughts when we're thinking about beaks and how important those things are. Woodpeckers take that beak thing and its ability to a much higher level. All right. So how many peck vertically? We have a little brown creeper. Those are the birds that when you look at your tree and it looks like something's moving and then they turn and you can see that bright white uh, breast and belly, then you can see it. They've got a little hooked bill. They're going in after spider eggs, spiders, things that tuck up under the bark, right? The little white breasted nut hatch, there's also a, um, a red breasted nut hatch where I am. Those also can, can hang and, and move vertically. A lot, a lot of kids think those are woodpeckers. They just happen to be able to make that vertical climb as well. And that's the only competition we have here. You may have others for that vertical food area. Uh, on the left is one of Ken's pictures that I love, and it's that pileated woodpecker, which getting a photo of a pileated woodpecker is so impressive. Um, other birds can land on a tree vertically. I've seen robins do it, but they can't move. And we're going to talk about the body design of woodpeckers and what allows them to take those vertical climbs and have that private dining experience that they only share with a few other species. The toes on birds who are capable of creeping like this are set with two forward, the second and third, so the middle two and the two that go backwards would be the first and the fourth. All right, that, this is known as a zygodactyl. Um, perching birds, um, they have a thumb, the halix. Uh, they have the thumb and those perching birds like the, the chickadee we saw, the one toe to the back and then three in the front. And there's actually a word, it's, it's anisodactyl, which is, anis is uh, Greek for unequal. So you have one in the back, three in the front versus two sets of equal toes. Some people, when I've delivered this before, said, well, owls have zygodactyl. The, yes, they do, but they perch. And the deal is they can swing one of their toes forwards and backwards. So when they have to capture prey, they can swing that toe to the back and have equal zygodactyl grip. But when they perch, they're going to pull that one outer toe around and use it as a perch. So now they become a perching bird. Whole nother program. You'll have to come to that one sometime. <laughs> so... This is worldwide, all right? They're found worldwide with an exception of New Guinea, Antarctica, Australia, New Zealand, Madagascar. You can see that on your slide. So it's, you know, this, the Pisidae family has three subfamilies, but we only have to look at the Pisids, the third group. Rhinecks are the old world. And they're, um, I'll show you a picture of those. They look kind of like a combination of a starling and a grouse, I'm not sure. Um, and then, so those are your, your old world. The Southeast Asia and the tropics in Africa, the piculates, teeny tiny little guys. Um, we don't obviously have those, but the true woodpeckers, the pisids, um, they're found most commonly. And that includes our flickers and our sap suckers. So my goal is today is for you to end this program and go, oh yeah, I know the seven woodpeckers that come through Illinois. If you're from out of state, find yours. Um, we'll be talking about those different, uh, how many we have, but there's no rhinex or piculates in the U.S. and Canada, just the true woodpeckers. There's a rhinex. How cool is that? Not a wedgy tail, though. They're not going to do the same actions as ours, okay? And then the picks, the little guys. This one does remind me a little bit of a downy, maybe, you know, uh, cousins in, in heredity, maybe, but little bitty guy. Notice the toes, though, that zygodactyl. We're going to we're going to see that in anything that's a, one of the woodpecker uh, group. So the tropical woodpeckers, um, they're, they're the ones that I had said were Southeast Asia, Africa, South American tropics, three Asian and one African species, and all the rest um, are elsewhere. And this one's in Brazil. So we're going to only talk about true woodpeckers. There's nearly 200 of these, but only 22 live in U.S. and Canada. So we've already brought it down to 22. We could probably learn all those 22. So if you're not in Illinois today, I challenge you to add the Illinois seven uh, to uh, the pile and see, <laughs> excuse me, what you have in your area. So 22, and we're gonna focus on seven here when we get that far. Just a really nice shots that I, I uh, was given from Ken. Really enjoy looking at those. So they've been around a long time. Uh, there was even a, uh, some of the sources said, 
um, said some of these. I couldn't find a lot of duplication, but I thought, you know, a million years is a million years. Um, 24 is another million. It's a long time. You know, it's a long time that they're finding these birds um, haven't really changed a whole lot, haven't evolved a lot. One thing's for sure, they've been around in, in their current physical form for a long time. Some sources felt other birds, um, such as owls, actually certain species of owls may have succeeded and stuck around only because of the cavities the woodpeckers created. There was even a resource I found, and they, uh, I believe it was a German scientist, found a um, fossilized woodpecker in Africa, and I think it was the first one found in Africa. So they named it after Nelson Mandela for his 94th birthday. That was his gift hey, to have. Peggy, a, yeah, I'm going to interject just for a hot second. Yep. Um, so there are a few people who are trying to get in because of licensing issues, and mm -hmm. I got the okay for it to open up and let people in, but okay. because there are so many, we may get dropped. Um, okay trying to get in. So I'm just going to give you just a quick warning that it's going to open up. And if it does get dropped, and this is for everybody listening in, um, just go ahead and follow the same links that you did beforehand and you, you can get back right back in. So continue <laughs> to teach, but if it gets dropped, all right, we'll, cool. we'll all get back in. All right. Sound good? <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> I'm always just in, amazed that this many people are interested and I'm grateful for your time today. Um, so uh, it's interesting that we all love nature and we're much more aware of males. The male downy always has the red dot on the back of his head the, and we're going to do some comparisons in a little bit and the the female would not have had that. On that male pileated you see that big red cheek patch where it looks like he missed with some lipstick well that's he and she wouldn't have missed right so there wouldn't be that red cheek patch and that length think about 17 inches use your hands and kind of guesstimate 17 inches that's a big woodpecker. They are very shy. They're hard to get photos of. Again, I'm grateful to Ken for the photos, um, but they are extremely shy. When they fly, um, they, they talk, they call, and they fly. And when they go by, it looks like a dark colored um, bowling pin. So if you see something screaming through a, a large deciduous forest that looks like a feathered uh, bowling pin, you've probably seen a pileated woodpecker. Okay, so here's what I want you to remember, and it's not hard. There's only seven species. There's the downy, and everybody loves the little downies. They're cute, very cute. The hairy, the hairy woodpecker. I wish they would have called it hairy like the guy, H-A-R-R-Y. Um, not sure where the hairy part comes in. They're feathery. Downies and hairies. If you look at your feeder or you're hiking and you see a downy woodpecker, but you go, dang, that is the biggest downy woodpecker I have ever seen. You're probably looking at a hairy. They are very similar, but the hairy is about the size of a robin, just not as plump and has a much longer beak. So you got to take a quick, a good look because the quick look is the spotted black and white. Um, it could be the red on the back of the head of a male, not if it's a female, everything else is very similar. The red headed has to have a full red head, has to look, have that full naped red head. They're the checkerboard uh, woodpecker. The red bellied, not sure. I don't see it's very red. It's kind of orangish to me, but I guess red was the thing. The red bellied, similar in size, has the mohawk, the red mohawk, okay? So the red-headed full head, red mohawk bellied. The red bellied sap or the yellow bellied sap sucker is a migrant in northern Illinois. They hang out in southern Illinois. They migrate through and move on up into Wisconsin and beyond to nest, but they are in southern Illinois um, during the winter often. And they are, you know, they're smaller than the, than the two prior listed there. Uh, but but um, definitely a different sound you'll hear when they come through. And the northern flicker, we have the yellow shafted. Out west, there's a red shafted. The yellow shafted flicker, uh, beautiful. And uh, we'll look at him. And then the pileated. So you've got the hairy downy thing. So those are kind of the same. You got red headed, red bellied. You gotta remember red headed has to have a full red head. The yellow bellied sap sucker and the and the flicker and the pileated. So we're gonna keep working on that and I'm gonna give you some pictures to see. So here's, here's the downies. So you have a female on the left and you have a male on the right. Notice the, the petiteness of this bird and they're sexually dichromatic, okay? So dichromatic means they're showing two colors. In other words, the, the male has the red and the female doesn't. We'll see one that is not dichromatic uh, here in a moment. So the downy, and here's a downy compared to a hairy. The best way to show you that is to show you those two birds facing each other. 
All right, see the beak on that hairy? They're both males, they both have the red. If they both had no red, they'd be both female hairy and, and downy. So I wanted you to see that. So there's your two that look alike. You can take that off your pile of seven, easy peasy. I like how that Harry's wedged his tail. That's a really um, big woodpecker move to wedge their tail. And it does have a spear-like tongue, uh, the Harry does. And at the end of their tongue, we'll talk a little more about the tongue. In his case, I know because I had one hit a window once and of course had to look at it. The tongue has uh, like harpoon hooks, spears on it, like a fish hook and it's cartilage at the tip. So when it goes in to get food, it can literally spear it. They don't have to peck a hole big enough to get the bug, just big enough to get their tongue in. And it's like putting a fish hook into a marshmallow. So it pulls it right out. So sexually monochromatic, that could be a male, it could be a female. Um, these guys are severely declined in number due to habitat loss. We need big dead trees for them. Small dead trees for bugs or living dead trees that have bugs, um, but they really are struggling and they're beautiful. So the fully redheaded, sexually monochromatic, same color for male and female. Um, they have found two million year old fossils of these guys in Illinois alone. So they've been around. So the redheaded's a little, a uh, little bit of a booger. So um, they've been known to tap duck eggs, uh, owl eggs. They've also been known to swallow small nestlings of other species. Um, I know we like to think of them as just they're too pretty to be so mean. And you'll often see them hawking, which is what flycatchers do. They sit and watch for insects, and they'll fly out, grab it, and go back to their perch. Um, so hawking is common for them when they're picking up their insects. Um, the, according to Cornell, I found one that said they'll actually take grasshoppers alive when they're trying to collect a lot of food, kind of hoarding, and they'll cram it into crevices and bark. It's still alive, but they cram it so hard in there it can't get out, and they come back later and eat it. Sorry, I'm making, a, making you cringe maybe. So that's kind of interesting. Notice before I switch slides is feet, two toes in the front, two in the back, very important. Here you go, um, these little guys. Here's our, here's our, our red-bellied. Again, not super red in the belly, but the bird world loved the red. The male is on the bottom. His mohawk goes all the way to his beak, though the female has a little red at the top of her beak. Notice the back of the, the it's on the back nape of her head there. It's not in that front on her forehead. This is a really good picture too. When we talk about skulls here in a little bit, look how rounded the woodpecker skulls are. And there's a reason for that. Uh, if they have a, a frontal bone and we'll talk about that, but there is your female and your male, not sure what that conversation's about, and they are sexually dichromatic. You can tell the difference without, uh, without much effort. So these guys, they actually have a tongue that goes two inches beyond the end of their beak and it's kind of sticky. They've been seen at hummingbird feeders. Mm -hmm. Sneaking hummingbird. I don't know how they figured that out. Maybe just watching the other hummingbirds doing that. But their biggest competitor would be the European starling. So once again, the European starling causes us uh, great anguish when it comes to our native bird species. I threw this red-bellied female in just to really push home the red belly over the red-headed. But also, this isn't a really good way to feed um, birds. Notice she's got all four toes wrapped in that mesh. That could end up with a tricky situation for her um, and, and you would have to maybe help get her loose. Now granted, it's not a bird of prey. She's not gonna shred you, but it's gonna be very stressful for you, stressful uh, for her, and possibly um, if nobody notices her, that could be the end of her. So keep that in mind if you choose to feed birds to think about how they operate, how their feet and all their other tools work, and never use anything metal with woodpeckers. Um, make sure if you use wire, it's coated wire, because in the dead of winter, especially with these guys, their tongue is damp and sticky. It'll stick to the metal, just like your tongue would stick to a shovel, and it will rip free. They, won't, they, they will pull till they rip it. So be conscious of what their needs are if you choose to feed those birds. Here's a picture of a male red-headed, or I'm sorry, red-bellied. I'm not helping you, am I? Another picture from Ken, a great feet, great tail uh, wedge there on the tree. These red bellies are just beautiful, pretty common compared to our red headed. So here's two yellow bellied sap suckers, dichromatic. You have a female on the left, notice her chin is not red. And on the right, you have a male. Like I said, they're a little bigger than a downy, a uh, little, well, I'd put them a little under the hairy. Uh, very speckly all over, very busy. Nice eye stripe, nice cap. 
um, fun bird. These, uh, they spend their winters, like I said, in Southern Illinois as their farthest north range in the winter. And then they migrate north through Illinois to breed, breed out of the state usually. That could change as weather patterns change. But they make a series of holes and then they leave and they come back. So they set their table and the sap from any tree, all trees have sap water of some kind. Um, and they come back and there's ants uh, maybe stuck in it. So they're getting some, some sugars, some carbs uh, and their protein all at the same time. People have seen hummingbirds um, drinking the sap too. And some, one of the resources I saw felt that at one time the hummingbirds were actually migrating north in um, at the same synchronous, you know, with the sap suckers because there was at least a guaranteed food source if the flowers weren't. Whether that, you know, couldn't find that supported, but I thought, you know, it would make sense. Next, this is one of my absolute favorites. Um, this is a, a northern flicker, so or yellow shafted flicker. The feathers carry a beautiful red color. When they fly away, it looks like somebody left a marshmallow on the top. They call it their rump. It's actually on top of their tail. Um, and so when, when a bird flies away and you see a flash of yellow and that big cotton ball or marshmallow color right on their rump, that's a, that's a northern flicker. The, they're dichromatic. The female on the left doesn't have that little black, what we would call a mustache. They both have the black bib on their chest, but they, and they both have that red mark on the back of their head, but the male has that black marked mustache. Look at the length of that beak. Um, it looks like it would be an amazing beak for uh, tree work, and they can, but look at the curve in it. These are the woodpeckers you see on the ground. They love insects. They very much love ants. We want them right now in Northern Illinois. We're having so much flooding and all the ants are coming up and being on the surface, getting into our air conditioning units, causing trouble. You can't have enough flickers right now in Northern Illinois, but they actually um, will go after. And they do have a barbed tongue as well, so they can stick insects. Um, they might eat a worm, they might eat grubs. Um, they've actually been known, they will, they will cavity nest because these are, woodpeckers are primary cavity nesters. However, they've been seen nesting in old kingfisher earth burrows. So they're very comfortable on the ground or up a tree, which would give them an advantage as far as longevity. Here you go. These guys are amazing. We're just now seeing some here in, uh, in Northern Illinois where I live. They are very territorial. They have a 10 square mile home range. They need adult trees. They have a lot of needs and they're very shy. So it's hard to keep up with what you have. Pretty much if you can find a big rectangular hole in a tree that literally square, you know, like squared off rectangle, you probably have a pileated. I actually saw a tree that got pecked down at about four, four feet off the ground. And I couldn't, I looked at it for a minute like, what the heck is that? Well, it was an old tree. It had bugs. And I'm like, oh, we have a, we have pileated's back because I didn't know I hadn't seen them. And on the pot, and there was just a huge perfect pile of debris on the ground, kind of like when you find um, beaver chews. It's all that consistent chews. This was a different shape pile, but I collected it and I put it in a jar and I call it determination because any bird that's willing to peck until it takes a tree down has got to have a gift. Um, and they're just magnificent. And for us that are uh, slightly aged, um, Woody Woodpecker was created based on this woodpecker. Anybody that said, who's Woody Woodpecker? Well, look it up, you'll see the resemblance, right? All right, so a niche, a neighborhood, where do they live? They're considered primary cavity nesters. They are the one that makes the first hole. They don't often re-nest. They can, sometimes will if they have to, but they prefer to make a new nest each year. Um, but they're a keystone woodland indicator species. Keystone because they play an important role in our ecosystem by creating cavities for animals that cannot put a hole in a piece of wood. So secondary cavity dwellers include wood ducks, owls, chickadees, and nuthatches. Uh, many birds prefer to be inside and that actually increases the possibility of the survival of those, of those young that are hatched in that, those situations. The indicator species, um, it's better than a migrant because except for the sap sucker, they don't leave. We can watch them year round and notice changes. Um, they offer a clear ecological service, which is where nature helps us out, and that would be the pest control, as I said, especially right now, the ants. Um, though they couldn't keep up with emerald ash borer, right, there was definitely an effort made, and maybe more young succeeded uh, and made it to adulthood based on the amount of food available, but it didn't stop the, 
horrific waste of ash trees that we had, but you know, you can only do so much. Uh, so they do stay year round and it, you, they're in their behavior, their changes in their behavior or numbers would be obvious. We would see that as we noticed when the redheaded woodpeckers started falling off uh, the chart. Why do they excavate? Food, kids in the winter. So when they're pounding um, on trees right now, they've probably already created a nest and they're looking for, for things to eat or to feed their young. Um, I can't stress enough that native plantings brings insects and that will also help, especially with our, uh, like our flicker population and our red-headed woodpeckers. They want those insects. Raising young in a nesting cavity. Winter protection. I get a lot of calls at the end of the season with woodpeckers pounding on people's wood homes. I have a few, suggestions at the end of the project, but a woodpecker doesn't know the difference between a tree and your house. They don't think like that. Uh, doesn't make it better for you, I realize, but they are looking for a warm space to be able to hunker in in the winter. They'll pick tree cavities that are broken branches as well, but they sometimes will start a new hole for that purpose as they have done on my on my nature education center. And the thing is, once they get through a layer, if it's, if it's warm from your home, you know, through that insulation, yeah, it's, they're gonna be really happy there. So you need to, as soon as you can, um, put a stop to that, to that effort. And then we'll, like I said, we'll, we'll mention a couple of things at the end. So there's a downy making another hole, uh, trying to figure out, you know, they'll, like I said, they'll occasionally reuse, but they really will uh, start a new hole. I had one similar to this in an old apple tree last year. Um, she came looking. I said, oh good, she's going to nest. And she made a whole nother hole a foot and a half above the old one. She just didn't want to move into the old house, I guess. So this is a big important piece to these guys. They're safe in that hole. Maybe the starlings, you know, are a problem. Maybe um, some other smaller, a weasel might find them and climb up there and get them. But 60% reach a year old because um, they have that time, that percentage time. Once they're out, uh, you know, once they're out of the, out of the hole, that death rate, you know, starts to increase clearly like it is for any other. Um, and they're slow. Our woodpeckers aren't the quickest birds and that makes them a little easier to pick off um, by other birds. So having that time to get a little bigger and a little bit stronger in those nesting cavities is pretty, pretty critical to who they are. I love these little pileated mohawks. And uh, can't tell, but it looks like the one on the bottom is definitely going to be a guy, a male, but I can't tell for sure if they're both going to be males, but definitely cute in their own way. So here's an example. Um, woodpeckers create the homes that are needed um, for those who can't, like we said, but dead trees are important. We've become um, a society that has to clean everything up and make it perfect. And perfect isn't good for everybody. Um, and taking down dead trees is a real detriment, especially clearing out spaces where our, our redheads want to be, those redheads that depend on snags and trees. And it was actually the Dutch elm disease and the chestnut blight that increased our population of redheaded woodpeckers for a long time because there were so many trees, people couldn't get to all of them and cut them down. And, and the ones that weren't endangering uh, personal property were left and they needed those trees. But we've become so used to thinking something is unattractive, we forget about its usefulness. Uh, squirrels clearly helped make this tree on the left a little bigger, they may have used it. And the one on the right, um, that little guy, whether he's in a broken branch hole or a woodpecker hole that healed a little bit, he sure is happy. And with a little curved beak, that screech owl would never accomplish a home like that. So food in the tree, the food in the tree, um, like I said before, it's pretty exclusive, you know, pretty successful if you can, you know, have that plate for yourself and only share it with a couple other birds. We don't know the ecological service, but it's in the billions. And I, I wouldn't even question that at all. Um, it has to be in the billions of the, of the pest protection that they've done for us uh, with, with what their choices are. So we're going to go through a couple traits as we, um, we're beyond our halfway point here, but um, we're going to talk a little bit about head design and these different things and what makes uh, the woodpeckers who they are. And I will add, I don't talk about it again later, but that large second neck rib, it's large because you can have more muscle attachment. So it would be up like where our like area of our, of our uh, like up high in like our collarbone area, they're gonna be this bigger stretch of ribs to hold on 
uh, to give them more strength, which is pretty cool to have more muscle attachment for throwing yourself forward, I suppose. So head design, the average woodpecker, look at that, strike speed 20 to 24 feet per second, and they're not even going a foot, right? So that's a pretty hard schwack. The, us having to do that would be detrimental. Uh, woodpeckers uh, force of, of the deceleration, you know, Newton's second law here at impact, 600 to 1500 G's. All right. Again, you have to have a specialized skull cavity in order to do that and not just knock yourself out on the first hit. Um, some things were saying that their brains are small, so it doesn't have enough inertia. And there was too many other pieces in the science, I think, that uh, through the years that I've studied and been told, I think that wouldn't hurt, but I think it's more, uh, there's a little more physics, I think, <laughs> involved. Um, the protractor muscle, uh, where the bill meets the skull, contracts right before they hit um, to absorb a lot of that and keep the bill in place. It doesn't do the daffy duck thing. Uh, the upper bill is slightly longer and it's, it's slightly longer and connected into, with a hinge, into what that frontal bone, remember I told you to look at how that rounded forehead was? That they have a frontal bone, kind of like a kickstand that doesn't move, and it allows them to take that impact, and then it sends that impact down and around uh, their skull instead of right smack into their, into their brain. So um, that, would, that would then make one, of, one believe that the force is directed around the brain and it doesn't matter uh, that the brain might be small. So here was a diagram that kind of gives you that idea. And we're going to talk about the tongue next. Pay attention. Um, that tongue. Um, <laughs> let me go back to that one. I, that one, I like that picture better. All right. Look at this. It, the frontal bone sits right in the, right in the front of the head. So the hit goes here, spreads out the love back here. The tongue tightens up. The tongue is connected to the front of the head. So it wraps all the way around. There's actually a hiatal bone, a, a flexible bone here that will either flatten to stick the tongue out or tighten to pull the tongue in. And that's important because uh, one of the other adaptations that they think happens is when that tightens up, it actually puts pressure on the jugular, which stops blood flow from decrease from ex exiting the brain cavity and so, and some research has shown that that blood helps to also buffer and and then it when the tongue relaxes it flows the blood flows again um, it'd be like in a blink but it's interesting when you look at all the research all the possible pieces that go into being a woodpecker the black backed we don't have a black backed woodpecker they have the largest frontal bone but it, I think by now you would guess that the flicker with a little bit of a curved bill and eating bugs it has the smallest uh, frontal bone because it's not as needed. So over time that adaptation has happened uh, and, and, or hasn't because it doesn't need that frontal bone. So there's that amazing tongue as it comes in and out of the mouth, it wraps over the top of the head with the hiatal bone back here in the back of the head uh, flexing to stick that tongue in and out, right? This is a little drawing of a flicker. And many of them on the end have some form of, whether it's two spear tips or multiple. Um, this particular skull in this picture connects by the um, nasal passage. Now, hummingbird tongues are the same. Hummingbird tongues work the same way. And the Anna's hummingbird, which is not, it's on the other side of the Mississippi. The Anna's hummingbird tongue actually connects, be, connects behind one of her eyes. And of course, me being me, I always wonder if when she sticks her tongue out, if she winks, but nobody seems to know that answer. So we're still looking, but it would be weird to have your tongue moving and connecting around your skull. Um, there's our little dusk mask. Look how the downy, so the downy is our little guy, our most urbanized, and look how short his beak is. So when he's hitting and getting sawdust, the closest thing to the tip of his beak would have been his eyeballs but he has a feather mask. So his tool, one of his tools in his, in this case, her toolbox, because she doesn't have the red, red mark on her back of her head. She doesn't get a bunch of junk in her eyes because she has that little dusk mask built in, which I think is a pretty neat adaptation. Zygodactyl, just a reminder on the toes, right? The zygodactyl, two in the front, two in the back, the middle two, two and three are in the middle forward and the other two are in the back, right? And that way they can, what they, they call uh, 
racking, riveting, laddering. There's lots of words for going up the tree, but that tail, if you look at that left photo of that male pileated woodpecker, he's using his tail as a lever. And that's important for this next slide because birds have a pygostyle or a tailbone. And in the woodpecker, they have a very large one and they're fused. So it's like having a paddle built into your tail. So the feathers flex a little, but the bones can't. They, they don't jointly move. You know, they move as one piece, but they aren't flexing in between. They're actually fused together. So that gives you the other tool in your toolbox to protect you from just flipping backwards off of trees. When you see birds flying through the woods, when you see a bird that tends to dip every time it flaps, well, of course, if you pull your wings in, you're going to start dipping, right? Well, they look like they're pulling in their wings and shooting their wings out. And smaller birds like the downy would have a quicker, tighter pattern. And your largest birds would do a lot more swooping. Okay, so think about size and how that action would happen. And no, you can't see me, but I am using my hands to show you that. Caught myself talking with my hands again. So that's kind of fun when you see a bird flying like that, that there's a good opportunity to, to possibly find a woodpecker. Something that you may not have noted, but I know you know, they don't sing. They make calls, right? They get louder and more cons constant in the spring when they're warding off other, other birds and other woodpeckers. Um, they drum in the spring to set up territory. If you have a metal flue on a stove, you have um, anything that the gutters, if they can make something loud and they find it, you're in trouble until they have their territory set up because they're gonna keep drumming. They have no idea that it bothers us. Um, and that's definitely something that can get very annoying, but they don't sing, they don't have a song. So woodpeckers, consider what they eat in the wild. Consider that they're picking for things, they're picking for protein, right? They're, they're bug eaters, right? They will eat seed because of the high protein in that seed. <clears throat> but all, you know, most of our birds, very few of our birds don't require insects to feed their, in, uh, their young. There are some seed eaters that um, can feed their young that. But even our, even our chickadees have to have insects to feed their, their kids. But look at, you know, any of these three are gonna have a lot of protein. But I put this on here. You have to remember these birds have been around millions of years. When we feed birds, right, we feed them for us. We really aren't saving anybody. Um, we might even be, sometimes I, we think about this, we might not be helping because natural, natural selection isn't happening. There's successes happening that wouldn't have happened in a natural environment. If you feed them, do it because you enjoy it, um, but don't do it if it's gonna stress you out that they are fully dependent on you because they've been around millions of years and they can do it even longer. Right, so dealing with uh, woodpeckers in the spring, they drum, that's kind of the exciting and noisy. <clears throat> spring and summer, you have nesting woodpeckers. That's usually not a big, um, a big problem because they've nested, so they're not sitting on your uh, house um, and they're not trying to bang into the side of your cedar home because it's not winter. Um, now, it doesn't hurt before you get too frustrated with a woodpecker. It doesn't hurt to make sure if you have a wood-sided home to double check for insect issues, termites, carpenter ants, because if they see them, they will go after them. So first, maybe before you get mad at the woodpecker, make sure your house is safe from insects who would do a much broader amount of damage than, than a woodpecker uh, making a hole. And then in the fall, when they do want to make that home, and they do, my sister just struggles every year because she has a cedar home in the woods. And I just, I explained to her, I said, they do, we can't explain it to the woodpecker that your house is not, is not um, a tree and it doesn't help you to, but knowing that at least understanding what they're doing um, is important. So what can you do? Because I know a lot of people get on these things for answers. Um, and I do have a website for you coming up. What do you know? What can you do? Netting works, but be prepared to untangle woodpeckers. They, you know, if you put up some kind of a netting over your siding just for that winter, pre-winter time, and then take it down each year, um, you don't want to be bird banding in your yard. And um, it's, you don't want to catch animals and have to deal with them. Uh, get a skunk stuck in netting, you're going to want to call somebody. <laughs> um, mylar strips, things that, you know, float around or move. Don't worry about those plastic owls. If you go online, you'll find more than enough pictures of birds sitting on the plastic owls. 
Um, it's not that they might be startled initially, but pretty much when that animal never moves anywhere, they're gonna know that it's, it's not harmful. So keep that in mind. I, I'm probably not helping the plastic owl sales, but it's, it's kind of probably not the best use of your funds. So we have a new uh, website that um, if you still go to Living with Illinois Wildlife, it'll take you there. We just finished uh, working on some bookmarks. They're not available yet in mass. Um, but if you go to that wildlifeillinois.org, um, you'll find information on woodpeckers, dealing with woodpeckers, other suggestions. Um, if you want to go down the rabbit hole of all birds, any of you birders out there, allaboutbirds.org, fantastic. Um, you can listen to every woodpecker's call and start um, memorizing those. So the, down, so the downy and the hairy, you've got the redheaded and the red bellied, you've got the pileated, and then you've got the flicker and the sap sucker sitting there. And you can listen to all kinds of stuff in there. And it's a fantastic website. So thank you. I have one more slide, um, but I want to thank you for, for spending your time with me for dealing with all these Zoom meetings. And um, it's, it's enjoyable, but hard for me because I like to see expression and I assess my, my groups by looking at how they're accepting my information or if they look concerned or curious. And I can't sit on the chat and, and talk to you like this, but I'm very grateful uh, for your time. Uh, please make sure you check out our Everyday Environment webinar series. Um, we've got some good stuff out there. It's been really a new learning curve for us, but I don't see us stopping doing this. I see us adding it into our repertoire when we get back to face-to-face. -face. So uh, definitely where there's a room to say so, you know, you can add topics that you're interested in. Um, the scan code is the same exact evaluation space as this EE e. Woodpecker's evaluation. Please take a moment and jot that down click on it right now and you'll still hear me talking um, and fill that out so we know what we're doing. Um, we're, you know, woodpeckers are fun to learn about, but the ecology, the need for habitat, um, understanding there's, you know, the, the dichromatic and monochromatic differences to help you ID and have fun with it. You can be a woodpecker ID expert by the end of today, just by thinking about those seven woodpeckers and how they are identifiable and what their needs are. So thank you so much. And make sure you note that if you're planning a large pond on your property, next week's webinar um, is that beginning basic construction of large ponds, not, not backyard little ponds, but big ponds. Um, you wanna join Jay Solomon for that next time. Um, so thanks again. Abigail, did we need to look at any of the, I'm sure, I'm not looking at the chat at all because I'm talking. I got you, Peggy. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> Abigail, <they're>, the best. <laughs> um, there were just a few questions, if you don't mind taking a minute to answer some of them. Sure. Um, so, well, one person just wanted to say that, ask if we get bonus points if a woodpecker is outside our window as we speak. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. I had one when, <laughs> right before I came on. I'm like, you know, it's a sign. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, with all the dead ash trees, why would the redheaded habitat be declining? Well, it was declining prior. So the, the emerald ash borer isn't really an old problem yet. So this was starting prior to us even having emerald ash borer. So it takes a long time for a population of birds to increase. And one of the largest amounts of ash trees are in our parkways. They were planted like in the thousands, millions in our parkways. And the parkway, redheaded woodpeckers are not an urban bird. They come in the spring, they'll load up on your bird feeder, right? I was talking to a friend last night and um, he was saying they load up and then they disappear. Well, he has nine acres, there's woods there. They go in and then they become a little more of a recluse to raise their young because they don't want to be seen. Really the downies are most urban. So finding those ash trees, it may turn into an, a, something like the chestnut blight uh, and the Dutch elm. That, those ash trees out in the woods where we're not worried about those snags and won't take them out just because they don't look attractive, that might help the, and increase our population actually. So that's a really good point and good question. Awesome. Um, so um, do pileated woodpeckers ever damage healthy trees? You know, if there's, 
I would guess that they can do anything they want at 17 inches tall. They tend to go after food first and housing, but it doesn't mean they, I can't tell you that they would never go after a live tree, but if they went after a live tree of mine, I'd get a bug check, you know, just to see if they're, it's, it wouldn't be as likely that they'd waste their time just making a dent in a tree unless they were drumming and found a tree that made lots of good noise. Will woodpeckers nest in pine trees? Oh, I would think so. They're a little sappy, but I don't know who would do that. It would depend on the habitat. I would guess up north where the pileateds are. I know they like telephone poles and that's been a problem. <laughs> um, and I would, I don't know that as a yes or no, but I don't see why they wouldn't as long as they were big enough, um, you know, big enough pine trees. So um, this was a question kind of similar from two different people about um, woodpeckers drumming on metal surfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, so somebody was saying um, her, the, their sister has a woodpecker peck on their aluminum gutter for two years in a row. And another individual <laughs> asked, um, you know, is that a, a, a territory thing, like setting the territory? Yeah. Yep. Yep. He's saying this area is mine and I'm going to beat on this until everybody stays away and I'm going to chase you and I'm going to go hit the other. They're also drumming somewhere else. You know, they're kind of they're making, they're flying in an area that they want to claim as their own. Um, but the gutter one is probably the noisiest one and they love noise. Nice. I read something where a red bellied woodpecker um, drummed loud enough out West that somebody heard it a half a mile away and like went and located it and it was a half a mile away. Wow. Um, will woodpeckers use human made nest boxes? I don't know, try it. It'd be great, great science to find out. Um, I have a feeling they are picky and they, you know, when I took down this apple tree, they quit using it and it was hanging over my fence and I waited to be sure no other residents wanted it this year. And when we took it down, it just crumbled the space inside that tree was so small i could not believe that she raised two different broods of four four woodpecker babies it's almost like a cup nest of a baltimore oriole in size or even smaller so it would be a matter of replicating that tightness they're not in there making a big square box with you know um places to sit right it's it was amazing to me how tiny that space was so do a little research get some maybe identification on what the what the shape is how big it tends to be beyond their personal size um and then maybe create something and then definitely let me know <laughs> let us all know i'm curious that would be very cool yeah um person says um is it true that only the female woodpeckers peck on houses that cause damage i don't I wouldn't have thought that, no, no, because um, spring, the damage is, is territorial, so that's males. And in the fall, winter, um, that anybody, everybody wants to get warm, right? And they don't stay together in that, they don't go into the hole together. So I would, my personal non-scientific belief would be that anybody that wanted to get in out of, in cover would make themselves a space. But I don't know for sure. Um, and, um, somebody asked for you to address the issue of having suet feeders out during the summer. Is that, um, you know, is that an issue and just kind of like, what is that about kind of thing? Um, suet kind of, true suet would not work in the summer because it's beef suet is different than what we buy in the blocks. Um, I, my personal choice is not to feed the birds in the summer to be sure that those young and the adults are feeding on natural food choices. And so that the young birds aren't taught, you know, how to just clear the feeders, um, personal choice. Um, suet's so slimy in the summer. And now you have different animals, possums, skunks, raccoons that can smell that. And you're gonna add to the climate of your yard. And then if you get those animals, you might get mice because if there's stuff on the ground, the mice come. And then people call me because coyotes are coming closer to their house because you've created a food chain um, that they don't know is there. So it's up to you. I don't think you should judge anybody that chooses to do it, right? If you don't, then that's your choice. I don't, it's my choice. 
but I think it's kind of, for me, it'd be um, not where I'd want to put my money in the summer as far as bird feeding. Okay. Um, so this person was asking, what time frame do yellow, yellow-bellied sapsuckers typically migrate through central slash northern Illinois? You know, that has changed. These last two wet springs, they came and went so fast. And I don't know if they stayed south, kind of like um, our hummingbirds and our monarchs last year and this year hung very low in Illinois. And I don't know if when they got a breaking point between storms, if they came through, I heard one. And in where I work in a small forest preserve, I usually hear them all the time. I saw remnants of them being there. Um, so I don't know if that window of opportunity beyond, between storms they went through or if they were quiet because it was colder um, and rainy. The woodpeckers aren't going to be able to go, aren't probably going to go into any kind of torpor when it gets too cold. Like hummingbirds can go into torpor, kind of like a mini dormancy next to a tree if it gets too cold. Um, the woodpeckers are bigger and they wouldn't maybe have that problem. But I usually find them April and by now May they're gone. Um, I know they're around um, sometimes as early even for us as late March because I've seen the holes in the drippy sap because it's sap season, right? So that sugar, the sh most sugary water is early March here. Um, that's when we tap trees for maple syruping because the, the sugar's running and it hasn't changed to the, the starch. You know, the sugars haven't changed to carbohydrates. So um, yeah, it changes. It really does. But it's def I would, if you had a broad window, I'd say end of March through um, early May for us here. Um, somebody asked a question about raising chicks. I don't know if you'll have time to address all of this. I feel like this is a whole other section, but this mm -hmm. is about like timing to hatch, timing to fledge. Um, if there's any other general comments you want to make about that, and then maybe the individual you know, comments that I, can email you to. The best thing for you to do, because they all have different timings and different, you know, one's a month, one's a little longer. Um, go to that allaboutbirds.org Cornell site, and every bird has a has its own natural history, its breeding, its habitat. Um, that's where I go for a lot of my individual bird information when I spot something new I want to think about because I don't have time to go through all that, and that's where I would take you right if I had the time. So definitely allaboutbirds.org. And this is kind of a similar question, but um, that maybe can be answered by that website as well, but. Um, oh, I thought it was a question, but I realize it's now a statement that literally just says, you can identify the species by their drumming. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah, and, <laughs> so. a lot. and you know what, though? That's a good point that I didn't make. Thank you to that person. Downies are so tiny and so close to the tree. It's just like, you know, it's really fast. But think about a pileated. It is still fast, but they have to think about the size of that body and that repetition um, there would actually be a gradually from downy up to pileated, a longer, very fractional difference of time between the drums. And I'm just glad all the parts of their head know how to do what they do to protect them. Good point. Um, so this was a question specifically about the female sap sucker, and I believe it's referring to your images. Mm -hmm. um, was her beak brownish rather than the male's black beak part of sexual distinction? Well, Hang on, let's go back and look. I didn't notice that, but we can definitely see if we can catch up with it. Don't get dizzy here up quick. <laughs> Hopefully we have time to do this. There was a couple, oops, there it was. I don't, I don't personally see the difference. And I think that if you had photos like this, you could maybe, you know, pick and choose. He's in a bit of a shadow. That's not the same tree. I, I clearly, I put, put two pictures close together for you to see the difference. Um, I think if you captured one and you were helping MISNET and doing some citizen science work, you might uh, be able to tell. But check out that, check out that allaboutbirds.org. I don't, I don't see it. I always look for that color and I forget that there could be other pieces you might want to look at. They also have that wing bar. See the white and black straight vertical down their wing? That's an also a, a really quick check when you see it going around a tree. You'll see that white and black line um, flash and that's another way to ID them. But now I'm going to be worried. I'm going to be looking at everybody's beaks now. Awesome. Well, those are all of the questions that I had. If anything comes up, I'm sure you can email Peggy oh, yeah. um, and check out that All About Birds webinar it, or uh, Birds website. It is really great. I personally use it as well. Yeah. Um, and then, and yeah. the Wildlife Illinois one is super awesome. That's, that's for if you have, you have lots of trouble. There's lots of solution yeah. help there and, and who to call if you just can't get it to 
stop. I'm going to repost the evaluation link in the um, uh, chat just so you all can go to it. And again, I just really encourage you because these evaluations really do help us get a better understanding as well as when we get good feedback or even uh, negative feedback or any kind of feedback, we're able to see, you know, what the engagement is and able to, to um, justify continue providing these because these do take time for us to do. And, um, and so we want to make sure that we're giving you all what you want out of these kinds of webinars. So please, please, please go out and fill out that evaluation. It shouldn't take too long. Um, Peggy, yeah, do you have any last minute notes? Yeah, we need to beat the uh, 180 for the Coyote program so I can just yeah. beat my own Coyote program <laughs> for evaluations <laughs> that are turned in. But you guys, thank you so much for sharing your time. I know it's time for everybody to go. I appreciate it. Um, and it's been fun. I just wish we were in person. Well, maybe not all 400 people, but you know what I mean. So stand by. There might be more coming uh, from the team even after this series gets completed. So Yep. And I posted the link in for the YouTube section or for our, our YouTube channel in the chat. So oh, wow. um, look forward to that in a couple of weeks. But if you missed any of the past ones, especially if you're like, I want to know more about that coyote one that Peggy keeps talking about, that <laughs> one's already up on YouTube. So please go check that out. It's pretty cool. Um, and we even have evaluations for that. Um, that if you watched it later on, if you want to give us some feedback and um, any other topics that you might want us to talk about. So, all right. Thanks, y'all. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everyone. All right, Peggy, I end it. Uh, you're welcome to end the meeting whenever I have a, a uh, all the questions like Captured. marked and everything. Yep. I didn't even know we were doing that last time and I got a nice printout of the chats. It's good to see what people want, need, know, because, you know, some people that know every, more than I do for sure jump on these things and I want to make sure they're getting something. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good to see.